Well, before the war, I was attending Hope College, uh, I, not majoring in religion or uh, chemistry, which are Hope's big lines, but those were depression years and there was no way I could get to any other school for post high school. And so I went in after working in the pickle factory for the summer with my $75 as a, uh, as a tuition for the first semester, I guess it was. A little bit less than is paid these days, quite a, quite a bit less. And in any event, uh, I had long wanted to be a naval officer. And of course, as soon as I was qualified by virtue of age, meaning when I was about 16, and in those years, I repeatedly tried to get into the Naval Academy, but they always managed to find some little thing that was wrong with me, like a hiatal hernia or a, a dimple on my nose or whatever. None of which uh, ever bothered me during my naval career, and that's a little bit ironic uh, when many people who got into the Naval Academy sat through three years of it uh, without getting into the war. Anyway, the opportunity came along to sign up for a 30-day cruise in the old battleship Wyoming. And of course, I leaped at the opportunity um, and hitchhiked to Norfolk, Virginia to get on the ship and I got there in time. In fact, I got there a day early and that's a story in itself. But they allowed me to stay on the ship and I was getting fed. And uh, then to my horror found out that I could not collect my travel money until after I was actually at home. And so I had to hitchhike back from, from uh, New York where the ship dropped me off after the cruise. Well, that was my start in Navy training. I graduated from Hope College in uh, 1941. At the end of the cruise in the Wyoming, it was expected that most of us would go directly into midshipman training. But as I was just a I just completed my junior year, I decided that I would want to go on and get my degree if at all possible. So I came back from that cruise and finished, almost finished my senior year in college. As it turned out, I was called to active duty uh, the 1st of June, 1941. And uh, therefore, uh, I had to leave before school was out because it was going to continue till about the 15th or 16th in there. And of course, I couldn't attend my own uh, graduation, but um, they did uh, um, allow me to leave. I 
hitchhiked to New York, and uh, no, I guess I got the train that time. Uh, they did send me a travel voucher. I joined the, um, the old battleship Illinois was just uh, in the process of being changed from being uh, the USS Illinois to being the USS Prairie State because they were going to build, they were planning to build another USS Illinois. When I got to uh, New York, I went immediately into midshipman training, and the next 90 days was um, absolutely full from dawn till, well, midnight practically, of attempting to train us. And I was in the first class. These are, we were called 90-day wonders. You probably have heard that term. Um, because at the end of 90 days, we would get essentially the same commission that a Naval Academy graduate would get, except we would be Naval Reserve and they would be U.S. Navy. I took the train to San Diego, where my first ship, the USS Case, was uh, back from Pearl Harbor on what was called a play wave, rest and re recreation, so to speak. So the men could uh, have 30 days with their families, which was a kindly enough uh, gesture. Uh, and also, it convenienced my getting on board. Uh, shortly after I got there, the, the play wave was over, and we set sail for Pearl Harbor. And uh, we were scheduled for a, an overhaul period alongside the destroyer tender, the USS Whitney. And it is thus that, uh, due to that overhaul period, that uh, I, I was in Pearl Harbor uh, at that time. Uh, actually, we were scheduled to be in the floating dry dock uh, but the USS Shaw, which was a uh, part of our division of destroyers, <coughs> had had a slight collision, collision with, uh, the dis with the oiler, the USS Sabine. And so it had to take our dry dock availability. And I don't know whether you've seen the pictures or not, but you can get one from my first, uh, the second book that I wrote, where the Shaw, the bomb went in and hit the forward magazine of the Shaw, and it just blew up into smithereens. And uh, this story would be over had we had that dry dock availability, but the, the Shaw took it in our place and consequently was blown up. We lost um, four ships out of our squadron of uh, eight ships that first day. N let me tell you just a little bit about <clears throat> how this all happened. We were along, as I said, we're alongside the destroyer tender, the Whitney, and uh, there was, uh, I was on board the ship, which I, for reasons I detailed, in the in my book, uh, so I was scheduled to take our baseball team over to meet play with a Marine team at at Eva, which was a Marine barracks in those days. And uh, the boat was to depart at eight o'clock. Well, needless to say, the boat didn't depart at eight o'clock. I was just finished shaving and was heading for the, the quarter deck when the general alarm went off. And uh, the, uh, interestingly enough, the officer of the deck came in and said to the senior watch officer, who was the senior officer on board, the captain and exec were both ashore with their wives, and uh, he 
he said, there's a fire on Ford Island. Well, there was a fire on Ford Island, all right, but as by the time he got back to call away the fire and rescue party, Ford Island was going up in flames and things were really going bad. Many, many bombs were dropped there to disable all the aircraft, and also on Hickam Field, of course. So I uh, was the only engineer officer on board. The, uh, there were two engineer officers senior to me, but they weren't there. So I had the responsibility of trying to put the ship back together. Being in an overall period, we had uh, all, all of our auxiliary machinery was turned down, was, was torn down. At, uh, it just isn't possible, and ships need maintenance, and especially warships, more so than anything else. So <clears throat> with that, I went about directing the crew to the best of my ability. Of course, I was wet behind the ears. I was not used to all this, and I wasn't used to being at war, and nobody else was either. So it was a very disastrous day, as you as you no doubt read in your history. I, I hope they give it a little bit more attention than I hear they're giving in some schools. What were the and, thoughts going through your head when you were giving these directions? Well, my first thought was this is a, a very realistic drill because by the time I'd come back from my stateroom and gone through, uh, as I was going through the wardroom, the uh, 50 caliber machine guns right over my head were being fired in relatively long bursts. And I thought, well, this is a very realistic drill. But as I went, headed for the engine room, uh, one of the planes that had attacked the battle line uh, was uh, throttled back and flying over our stern uh, just like he was at cruise speed and our after machine gunners were going after him. And uh, I don't think they got that plane, but we did get four other uh, planes during the attack, just with machine guns, because of course our, our five inch battery, we had five five inch guns, five inch 38s. Uh, they were all torn down, the ballistic computers were out of the guns, and, the director was out, and of course, the uh, stable platform, which allows you in the roll of the sea to fire the guns, <laughs> it wasn't there either. And of course, in the engineering spaces, we had parts lying all over the place, and a sizable number of them over at the, on the tender. So uh, we had quite a job trying to put the ship, or do putting the ship back together, but by one o'clock in the afternoon, I say with a bit of pride, we had the whole thing back together so we could get underway. Not due to my efforts, because I, as I said, I was very inexperienced, but to, due to a very experienced crew that did their job in, in a marvelous way, and of course, they only had a part of them, just as everybody else. The realization was when I, I stepped out of the wardroom on my way to the engine room, which was my battle station, and here was this Japanese plane with a great big red ball on the side of it, and the pilot looking out at me like this. So he was, well, the length of the ship was about uh, 300 feet, so the part I was looking over was about 200 feet, and it looked to me like he was about an equal distance away, so he was maybe 500 feet from me. And my thought at the time was if I ever see that SOB, I'll recognize him, but of course, to the Japanese, all whites look alike, and to us, all or most Japanese <laughs> look alike, so I'm sure that was a facetious thought. Well, that was that day, uh, except that uh, the tragedy of the evening when the Enterprise 
the Enterprise had been sent out to deliver some planes to the, the uh, Marines who were on Wake Island. Well, when she came back, it was just after dark, and although she had signaled many times that uh, she was returning the time and everything else, and the planes are well marked, nevertheless, some trigger-happy people on the ships in the harbor opened up as they came in to land on Ford Island, and I can't remember the exact number, but they shot, they shot down four or five of them. I guess I should remark about what things were like uh, after the attack. The battle line, and you may, have, you may see pictures of this, but the, the battle line, of course, was devastated. The Arizona blew up, and <clears throat> the whole harbor was covered with Navy fuel oil. Uh, and on top of that, much of it caught fire because of the fires in the battleships and uh, the cloud of black smoke that went up from the, the combination of the fires in the battleships and, and uh, on the surface of Pearl Harbor was just astonishing. It went up some thousands of feet and it, it just black as ink and it was a mess. Well, there are a lot of emotional things I could tell you about that, but I think I better skip over those. And that one rather dramatic thing that happened to me <coughs> was that the ship evidently got orders to drop a depth charge on a miniature submarine that had gotten into the harbor, and that's kind of an interesting story in itself if you haven't heard it or maybe if you have heard it. When the garbage, the Japanese had these miniature submarines and they delivered five of them off the coast of, of Oahu, and uh, two of them were assigned to go into the harbor and the way they did it was to wait till the garbage barge was coming out and they came in. And uh, so there they were. Uh, one of them was sunk before the attack actually began from the air by uh, some very aware uh, men on a ship anchored in the, or just out of the fairway uh, off Ford Island in the harbor. And uh, they managed to put a shell in it, and so it was pretty well established it was sunk, but there were bubbles coming up from it and everybody was so panicked and so on. We got orders to drop a depth charge on it, which we did by well, I'll describe in a minute. <clears throat> I was assigned to go in a motor whaleboat and go sit over that submarine, with which you could identify because there were bubbles coming up from it. Well, there's only about 25 feet of water in the fairway. Uh, Pearl Harbor is not excessively deep, although it's been dredged a lot since that time. Well, it still isn't very deep. So. <clears throat> there I sat with the whaleboat crew till the ship could, the conning officer, which was by then the skipper, the captain, had the sight well in mind, and uh, he gave me a blast on the whistle to tell me to haul Fanny toward Ford Island, which I did. Well, they went over and they dropped that depth charge, which they had rigged up a jury rig so that it wouldn't blow the back end of the ship off in that shallow water, because the depth charge had to be set at 25 feet, which would blow the back end of the ship off if we did. Anyway, when they came and they blew the whistle, we 
went as fast as we could, kind of putt, 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 putt toward Pearl Harbor. And when that depth charge went off in that shallow water, I want to tell you, it looked like the whole of Pearl Harbor was going up over our heads. But we, aside from being rocked and having a lot of oily water dumped on us, we <laughs> suffered no other damage. From there, I guess that's enough on Pearl Harbor. We, but then, as things were bearing down toward the big battle of Midway, which was the turning point of the war, and somehow, I don't understand this, but it's being overlooked more and more and more for some reason or another, it was the actual turning point in the Pacific. Well, our part in that was, uh, by now, I went over to have coffee with the chief engineer, and, and uh, I did. I was astonished at his quarters. As relatively, of course, we held the same position. He was the chief, and by now I was the chief engineer, because these other people all went off to flight training or this training or that training. Now I'm just commissioned for a little over six months, and I'm the chief engineer of this ship. Well, I didn't know. I was a mathematics major. I wasn't an engineer. But, but I learned an awful lot in a very short time. With the help of some very, very able uh, enlisted engineers who'd been around for years and years and years. But anyway, we were sitting in a space. Well, there isn't a comparable space here. But his stateroom was about 20 by 20. And he had lounge chairs and a big sofa. <laughs> so I, I couldn't help thinking of the contrast. And then he said, well, maybe you'd like to see our engine room. Well, it was the engine room and fire room combined. And it was immense. You know, it was the whole after part of the ship, wide open. And they had a little, this is what got me. The case had about close to 50,000 horsepower, which of course went into its speed uh, primarily. Tankers weren't supposed to go fast. Well, they had a little Butson engine about 15 or 20, what did I say no, about 1,500 or 2,000 horsepower as compared with our 50. <laughs> and we're a little bitty ship, you know, this great big tanker. Well, the war went on, of course, and we spent six months up in the Aleutians and uh, were patrolling largely in the fog and trying to, trying to exist. There was one short time, as it was actually a, a part of the Battle of Midway, the Japanese diverted a small carrier task force to come up and attack uh, Dutch Harbor. And uh, we were right across the island from Dutch Harbor, which is on Unalaska Island. And uh, we were anchored there supposedly to attack any Japanese force that came, surface force that came in there. Well, it's a good thing they didn't, because we had our two fleet destroyers, the Case and the Reed, that I mentioned. And then we had five old World War I destroyers that had had their torpedoes removed and their main battery, and they were just mine layers. So we didn't have much to work with. And the Japanese flew over us. We, we were at anchor in there waiting for all this to happen. And Japanese attack airplanes going to uh, Dutch Harbor flew and Kodiak flew right over our heads, and uh, but but at maybe ten or fifteen thousand feet, we're huddled in this narrow harbor and thinking they didn't see us. After the war, when I was a student at the Naval War College. They showed us pictures that the Japanese had taken of 
our group of ships down there. They could have wiped us out any time they wanted to, but they had more important targets to go after. So that campaign went on for a while. The only, <clears throat> only real fighting we had was after many, many, many attempts to get at, um, yeah, my memory failed me. The Japanese had established a base in the Western Oceans. Mm -hmm. And uh, I should be able to say the name of it right now, but that doesn't really matter. We tried and tried and tried to get in there, but we were always fog bound. And it was danger, considered dangerous to go. We had, we didn't really have effective radar yet at that time. And that, things like that are kind of hard to believe to today's mind, I, I must say, because people say, well, gee, I've, I've got radar in my car, or I've got a GPS or whatever it is. Why didn't you use that? Well, that's like saying, why didn't Washington use machine guns when he went on the attack? Well, the fog finally broke, and we did get in, and we hammered the place pretty thoroughly. Um, and the case got credited with the sinking of one destroyer. But other than that, I'm not too sure how much damage was, was done. From which we got orders to go down into the Solomons. <clears throat> and we got there just at the tail end of the, of the Guadalcanal campaign and uh, participated there, had a few adventures, but nothing like the Marines were having on shore, and their trauma was very largely over by the time we even got there. So I'll skip over that. <coughs> we then supported activities going, going to the west along that chain of islands down there, <coughs> north of Australia. But that was largely in support of, um, of the aircraft carriers. And so uh, we didn't really get in any fighting action. One of our principal missions was picking Airedales up off the water when they failed to make the carrier <laughs> or something like that. Uh, in those days, we used what was called plane guarding so one destroyer would be lying or steaming along uh, behind the carrier a couple hundred yards whenever there were uh, aircraft activities going on. In other words, takeoffs or landings. Our first mission was to be in the support group hammering Saipan during the marine landings there. And uh, that was extremely intense and uh, wore us out. Most gruesomely, when the Japanese decided in the very last days <coughs> of the invasion to persuade their civilian population, of which they had some hundreds, to jump off the cliff on the north end of the island uh, as into the water, kids and all, women and children, the whole shooting match. And boy, I'm telling you, with, with the Japanese military bodies and the U.S. Marine bodies, because the Marines were driven right back into the water uh, the first few days of the attack, then all these people jumped in. The, the odor, the, 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 about that time, the wind just flattened. It just, the ocean there was as flat as this floor. And the odor, of course, was horrific. Nobody could eat. It was just retching all the time. But <clears throat> eventually, they kind of a gruesome thought, but those bodies would bloat up until they burst, like, boom, and then that body would disappear. 
So that's warfare. I, I was the chief engineer of the ship. Uh, I started out as a lieutenant junior grade, and by the time I finished that tour, I was a full lieutenant. Now, for the uninitiated, that's the equivalent of uh, a full lieutenant is the equivalent of a captain in the Army or the Air Force. And of course, our terminology is all, all different. Um, and that ship, well, after the attack, uh, we were participants in the great Philippine Sea Battle, where the Japanese threw e everything at us that they could. But uh, our aviators, by and large, shot them up, although I mean, the statistics, we usually say how many Japanese we shot down, and we, we shot down, I think, two planes in that action. The Japanese lost something like 300 planes. What they don't mention is I think we lost about 200 or something like that. So it's warfare is gruesome any way you cut it. Um, then, the most interesting thing happened. Um, I got orders to leave the ship. We were going down, well, we had one more campaign we went through. <clears throat> and then we were staging to go into the Philippines down in Guadalcanal once again. And just before the ship was to sail, there came my orders to go to Naval Architecture School at the University of Michigan. Now, how that happened, I can't tell you. Based on my simple little old mathematics degree, I had no background for that whatsoever other than the math, which was limited. So that was the end of World War II as far as I was concerned by the time the war ended shortly thereafter. I was promoted to lieutenant commander. And this gets into the question of what did you do after the war? Well, my father had gone bankrupt in anticipation of the Depression, about 1928. And so I had, I had no family business to go back to. I had, I had nothing. I didn't even have a teacher degree. I thought that Anybody who went into teaching had to be nuts. And so although Hope College offered a degree in education, uh, that wasn't for me. So I decided I should stay in the Navy, and for good reason, which I did. I, I didn't anticipate everything that was going to occur after that, uh, of course. but. Uh, I made the transfer, and uh, and then aviation was everything in those days, everything. But, you know, it's ch fashions in warfare change about as fast as the ladies change fashions and put on dungarees like that, uh, pretty warm, pretty worn out. But anyway, aviation was the big thing, and I think if I made a mistake in my career, it was this, that I applied to go into aviation. And uh, I did then. Um, I went through flight training. I should tell you that in advance of that, I was the exec executive officer, number two in command of a destroyer, the Henry W. Tucker. And the big thing that happened during that, I joined that ship out in China, actually Okinawa, and uh, we came back, it was around Christmas time, and we had been home back in San Diego just a week or less. And we got the word that we were to go to Anahuitoc on the atom bomb test. And that was a very big thing. Uh, I was one of two people the closest to three shots that 
at Anawetok, all of which I detail in my book, if you're interested in any of that. Um, this is after the war, this is what year? This is uh, 1947 to 8 in there. Um, <clears throat> this was after the bikini test, and now uh, at the island, or atoll of Anawetok, and I could talk about that at quite some length, but I, I think we'll pass over that and get on with what happened next. And what happened next was that as that phase was coming to an end, right out of the blue I got my orders to flight training. I'd, I'd kind of halfway forgotten that I had applied for flight training while I was still a midshipman in that 90-day wonder period. I guess I thought, well, that's over. And, you know, I'll be in destroyers for the rest of my life. Well, lo and behold, in came a dispatch asking if I would still go to flight training if offered. So as a, as a lieutenant commander, I went through flight training with a bunch of kids your age, and, you know, and uh, that I'm, I wasn't the best aviator in the world, but I was good enough to get through it, and uh, I discovered afterward that a lot of aviators aren't quite what they think they are. They don't grow wings themselves. But anyway, I got my wings, and lo and behold, what happens next? Just got nicely settled back in our house in Coronado, San Diego, basically. And the Korean War started. So we were in the ready squadron in San Diego, so now I'm right in the midst of another war. And uh, this can become a little wearing over time. <laughs> so I, I flew 50-some missions in uh, big planes in the Korean War. We were based in uh, Iwakuni, Japan, and uh, flew mostly out over the, um, what is that body of water? I'm going to say the Sea of Japan. That isn't quite right. Um, with the idea of primary idea primary idea of keeping down any Inchon in reverse coming back from from uh, China because by then well not by then but after we were out there about six months the, the communist Chinese came into the war and now while they didn't officially acknowledge it we were fighting both the North Koreans and the Chinese I was flying, uh, at that time, uh, PBMs, PBM-5s, um, large seaplanes. And we, it was an interesting thing, I think. We, we could uh, bring to bear on attacking aircraft um, two, a, a twin bow turret, a twin stern tur turret, and um, twin uh, free swinging guns on the side of each plane. We could just open up the doors of the plane <laughs> and uh, fire there. And uh, so the North Koreans or the Chinese, as the case would be, would send out a section of aircraft to to attempt to shoot us down. But the truth of the matter was we could bring more guns to bear on them than they could on us. Except, of course, the underside of a seaplane is very vulnerable. So our defense was to drop down to about 50 feet above the surface of the sea. <clears throat> so they couldn't make any high side runs on us. They couldn't make any low side runs on us. All they could do was come in on a direct attack, and they didn't like it too much that we could bring twice the number of guns to bear on them as they could bear on us. So that was. And our squadron suffered no damage. 
but the squadron that relieved us. Somehow, although we briefed them very carefully, we went on their initial patrols with them. I flew several patrols in their aircraft <coughs> with them just to help, and I kept emphasizing, now you have to come back at low altitude. Well, about the very first thing that happened, we were still there as a squadron getting ready to leave. One of their planes thought he didn't want to take the time to go at low level all the way down and in through the Straits of Shimasenki and, and back to Iwakuni. So he climbed up to altitude, and just about the time he got up there, there were the Chinese planes just raking him over for a fare thee well. When he got back to the base, he called in for landing instructions, which were given, and of course we're landing on the water. <laughs> and uh, he landed, made a, made a nice landing outside the breakwater, and then kept the throttle right on because he'd sink if he, they had so many holes in that hull. But of course, as he approached, <laughs> as he approached the ramp, he had to take the throttles off, and so she just slowly sank right there as he increased the throttles and held it in position till we could get a get a tractor out there and a wire on him, <laughs> hoist him back on the ramp. But they were extremely lucky. Lucky they only had three, three wounded in the plane, and they were rather superficial. They went to the went to the Air Air Force Hospital there, and they were back on duty in just a week or so. Where was your plane ever attacked? Uh, well, yeah, frequently, mm -hmm. uh, but in the type of attack I'm I'm talking about, where. As we could pick we could pick them up with by now radar was by that time radar was good enough that we could detect when they took off from their base up at the north end of the Yellow Sea. So when they did or we estimated when they would be there, that's when we dropped down to about fifty feet and we'd invariably wind up in a Mexican standoff. They, we never got hit by a single bullet, and we think maybe we inflicted a little punishment on them, but I'm not too sure of that either. <laughs> so that was that. Was that. But at the end of all those experiences, I was awarded the I guess five air medals and, and a distinguished flying cross. And that was the end of the Korean War. And then it went on. Uh, I have a few academic credentials that get in here because I was the assistant professor in naval science at the University of Minnesota for two years. That, was a slightly embittering, I guess I shouldn't really get in there, but it was a somewhat embittering experience because by that time my father was dying and it was anticipated that he'd die. I had requested that I get to go to any of the five or six um, schools that had Naval ROTC uh, within easy driving of, of Holland. I guess our friend has left, but anyway. <laughs> um, so where do I get assigned? The University of Minnesota. Well, it takes forever to drive around the lake, either, either going north or going south. So that was a bit embittering. And, um, things went on and on and on. And <clears throat> eventually, uh, well, I was, of course, back in a squadron now as the exec of the squadron, but in terms of total hours of flying, uh, relatively inexperienced compared with some of the other pilots in the squadron. And uh, there was a combination of effects, all these things. By then we had three children coming along. One of them was um, 
quite seriously traumatized by my long absences. And we just made a decision that it was time to resign and uh, applied for a commission in the reserve. Uh, I was then a full commander. And uh, I will say this, I, I think if I, uh, if I had realized what I was going to go through um, in terms of threat to my economic <laughs> position, I, I would have stayed. I was within five years of the first target level for retirement, which would be at 20. Um, if I made captain, which I fully anticipated to do, um, then the target is 30. And that's that's what should happen. But all these bad things happened, and uh, so I did resign and, uh, and went back to Holland. But there were certain things that I didn't, I thought I had studied all of the ramifications of this thing, but there was one hooker that I hadn't found. As I mentioned, I was a commander. The hooker is this that a regular officer resigning from the regular Navy, if he wishes to retire from the reserve, has to do his last 10 years in the reserve. That's the law. Well, somehow I skipped over that provision. Here's the hooker. You can't stay around in the Navy without being promoted. And you have to be selected in order to be promoted. So there I was having to do 10 years in the Naval Reserve for sure and I would have to be selected for the next higher rank of captain. Well, as it all turned out, after much nail-biting and concern and so on, uh, I was promoted. But let me tell you why that was where it was not very smart on my part. Because I was thinking, well, here I am, a decorated naval aviator and so on. Well, that doesn't hold any water in the reserve squadrons. They're all... Well, I say all, but a very large percentage of them are airline pilots who have thousands of hours in the air. And here I am with my piddly little 1,500 hours. They didn't look very favorably on my coming into any of their squadrons, plus the fact that I was basing myself in Holland, Michigan, and the nearest bases from which I could fly were Gros Eel 200 miles away and um, I forget the name of it, right north of Chicago, uh, another field approximately 200 miles by land from Holland. And when you talk to those people and you're facing a bunch of airline pilots who have eight or ten times the number of hours in the air that you have, they're not going to give up their jobs in the reserve just to take care of you, you scoundrel. <laughs> so that was a real problem. As soon as I caught on to that, I turned in my wings and requested uh, once again to be designated a surface officer. And at that, at that time, there was then no problem. I was promoted to captain in the reserve. And I then finished. 32 or 3 years altogether in the Navy. <clears throat> well, I learned a very great deal about bureaucracy. I learned how to be a pretty good sailor. I, I learned uh, navigation basically on my own because you, you, you have to use navigation, whether you're in destroyers or in the air or whatever, 
uh, that's another thing. The, the fighter pilots don't learn any navigation at all. They just go in on their homing to their bird's nest. <coughs> uh, I think I learned a lot about self-control. Um, I have a tendency to be a bit impetuous. I think um, you would classify me as a type A personality. <coughs> I learned to control that. I learned to live in bureaucracy. If you had to give yourself some advice before you went into the service, what would it be? If you could go back in time. Well, it was my boyhood ambition to be a naval officer. So I did it. I'm not sure I would do that again. <laughs>